good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Weather Center Nazario. It is officially hump day, folks, October 11th, 2023. Forgive me if I skip a lot of the formalities today. We have so much weather information to cover today. I'm probably going to skip over quite a bit of it and leave it for our 8 p.m. tropics talk, but we're pulling no punches today. We're just going to jump right in. These are the two areas I really want us to pay close attention to. We do have a lot of severe weather breaking out across the southeast in affiliation with our previously identified Invest 93. That's no longer highlighted here by the National Hurricane center doesn't mean it's been taken out of our weather pattern altogether we're going to get there in a moment but first we have newly identified invest 94l which i'm very very thankful that national hurricane center highlighted this if you tuned in for yesterday's segment i mentioned that national hurricane center could possibly lag behind in highlighting the secondary feature right behind now tropical storm sean and i'm very glad that they decided to punch the button real quick because today's trends are looking a little bit more concerning and we're going to go right into that as we speak so first and foremost we're starting out with the 12z Canadian Canadian model because the Canadian model has been fairly reliable all hurricane season. As of recently, the Canadian model was one of the few that were kind of hesitant in terms of developing that secondary feature and wanted to place most of the emphasis on Tropical Storm Sean. However, as of 12 Zulu today, and even a little bit of a semblance of it at 0Z overnight yesterday, the Canadian model is now on board with developing a full-fledged tropical cyclone out there in the main development region and pushing it straight into our Caribbean Sea, going right across the same areas that were previously hit by Tropical Storm Philippe and previous entities earlier in the hurricane season. You can also see that the Canadian model has been very, very insistent that we're still expecting some sort of Central American gyre activity close to the Yucatan Peninsula coming out of Central America. However, lately the model continues to want to form something up in the Southern Caribbean and then immediately punch it right into the Yucatan Peninsula and then maybe further organize it once it gets out over to the Bay of Campeche, similar to what we saw take shape with Invest 93. Moving right along immediately, guys, we're going to get into our German and our European model. The Icon and the Euro model have been like this, neck and neck in terms of developing that 94L feature out there, so I do anticipate, like the title of this video suggests, Tropical Storm Tammy is coming and she's going to be the one that's going to cause some trouble and we really have to keep a close eye on her. As you go through time, you can see that non-tropical entity really ravaging the southeast. We're going to talk more about that here momentarily. There goes Tropical Storm Sean indicated on both model members moving off safely to the central parts of the Atlantic Ocean, but because it's going to butt up against that frontal line, if you guys can see it, it's a little more indicated on the Euro European model, this here is actually a frontal line. Even though we have southwesterly winds coming off the Caribbean, what that shows is a little bit of return flow around our nor'easter system that's trying to kick off off the northeastern United States. So all of this to include this little anti-cyclone that's buried in between all of these frontal systems, you can see it on both models on either side, that's what's likely to help drive Sean a little further to the west, albeit weakening because of the increased wind shear brought on by both those phenomena. But if you're watching what I'm paying attention to, that low lower latitude system on both of our models really begins to deepen down, especially on the Icon. The Icon is anticipating a full-fledged tropical storm and a strengthening one at that as it moves towards our leeward and windward islands. The Euro is slowly but surely increasing the intensity of this feature as well, albeit it does look more and more like an open wave until it gets into the Caribbean, but you can see the wind field on it is already growing, moving due west and all those easterly winds coming off of that massive high pressure over the North Atlantic. Now, you probably guessed this, but the GFS is the one outlier in this whole situation. I'm not entirely sure why it wants to be the outlier, especially when you look at the ensembles in comparison to its main run. You can see the ensembles are on track with everything the Euro Icon Canadian, even the Korean model are calling for. I think I know exactly why the deterministic run is doing something a little differently, and we'll get into that here in a moment, but I want to show you the main run as we speak. So here's our 12Z GFS. You can see Tropical Storm Sean taking off and moving to the northwest before encountering that very vigorous frontal line and that 1018 high trying to build in in wake of all those frontal features that is especially going to squash Sean and try to move it further and further to the west as another potential rainmaker for our leeward islands and the greater Antilles of Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic and further to the west. You can see that the GFS is a little steadfast on its main run to develop our Invest 94 but then as it approaches the leeward islands you start to see something suddenly deepen down and move due north getting picked up by our frontal features. Now this is very interesting in my opinion and I'll show you exactly why when we go back to our comparison tool on weathermodels.com. Another interesting area to note is if you look, it's trying to pull a fast one on us and form something up in our Western Caribbean Gulf of Mexico towards the very tail end of the run, kind of moving it out into the future from where it was initially bullseyeing a hurricane forming up at the very end of last week. If you guys remember, we were talking about that as well. So GFS is back to its usual 
ism is what I'll say, but we'll go into the comparison tool and I'll show you why I think that it is. Real quick, I just wanted to show you the difference between our deterministic run and all of our GFS ensemble members. And this is what looks a little bit more concerning for me, especially for our folks out there in the Caribbean Sea. Not only the Lesser Antilles, but further to the West, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Cuba, Cayman Islands. I'm watching for all you guys. Let's go through this loop and we'll simply let it unfold. You can see out in the Atlantic, we have a tremendous amount of agreement that there are going to be systems out there. That's for Tropical Storm Sean right there. And then you can see, even though they're a little bit mixed together, we have several spaghetti plots working right through the Lesser Antilles and beginning to strengthen as they move through those islands and towards the Greater Antilles before maybe hooking to the north, somewhere in between Puerto Rico and the eastern tip of Cuba. Now, it looks like Florida, for example, and most of the northern Bahamas are unscathed from this. The problem with that is I've been watching these ensembles feverishly, 0, 12, 0, 12, 0, 12, and with every updated run, not only from the GFS, but from the Euro and the Canadian model, we're slowly seeing these tracks move further and further to the west. So regardless, there's a lot of land out there that these systems could impact, whether it be as a named storm, we're talking about you, Sean, or future Tammy on the horizon. Regardless, we're getting closer and closer to some big land masses. So if there was a time we really needed to hunker down and start monitoring things in the tropics, it's right now. And you can see that some of the ensemble members are still highlighting something trying to sneak out of our Western Caribbean. So let's just put it this way. The Atlantic is hot. We're getting into middle October, but we're still hot out there. The African monsoon has not shut off, and some of our long-range ensembles want to bring off a third entity in Africa. But we'll get to that at a later date. We're going to save that for another video. So you're probably familiar with this. We've used this on Weather Center before. We're looking at 500 millibar geopotential height anomalies, and I'm going to compare the Canadian model, who has that due westward track, to the 12Z GFS that has it going west and then suddenly hook into the north. So we have the GFS on the left-hand side and the Canadian model on the right, and it goes back to that long wave meridional or zonal pattern, or one that's more north to south and slower moving, and one that's more east to west and moving a little bit faster in terms of what our upper level winds look like. If you watch first on the GFS, you can see we have that trough digging in with that next major system that's going to form over the Great Plains and wreak all sorts of havoc and severe weather for our Midwestern states moving towards the Great Lakes in the Northeast inevitably. But then if you look over to the right hand side of the Canadian model, at about this point in time, 12 to 18 Z on the 17th, we're about neck and neck. We're looking pretty good in terms of run to run and model to model consistency. This is where it starts to deviate from one another and the GFS is the only one currently doing this. If you watch on the left hand side, we see that troughs tend to stick around a little bit longer and it deepens just a little bit more in terms of its overall amplitude before finally exiting the United States into the Western Atlantic. And now if you look over to the right at this current timestamp, this is the 20th of October, you would say, well, David, you know, it looks like we still have a trough on both charts. What's the difference here? Let me go back in time and I want you guys to fixate on that right hand side. So we're rewinding back to about 120 hours. There's our two troughs looking very good. In fact, even the intensity of that upper level ridge over James Hudson Bay looks pretty identical across models. But if you watch on the right hand side, notice that our trough does not deepen as to the full extent that the GFS is anticipating and it actually evacuates from the United States altogether. And at this point in time, as we go into the 20th of October, you can see a full fledged mid amplitude ridge along the eastern coastline of the US and we still have the same trough on the GFS. So I think that's why we're expecting a bit more of a northern tug, at least in our GFS deterministic model, but the ensembles are picking up on what the rest of our model platforms, to include the KMA, which I don't have pulled up for you guys, is depicting with that westward shift in a lot of what Tammy is expected to do. All right, guys, so we got to go talk real time now. We have this mess of activity in the Gulf of Mexico. This is our ever so fateful Gulf of Mexico system that we've been talking about for what feels like two weeks now on Weather Center Nazario. It is unfolding. Areas in the southern Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and the Florida Panhandle are already feeling the effects. We have some embedded thunderstorms already starting to take shape in southern central Florida as well, because if you remember, we talked about it very briefly. We didn't put a lot of emphasis on it, but if you look over top of Cuba, parts of the Cayman Islands, this is actually a tropical wave that's been fueling some thunderstorm activity as it's made its way west all the way through the Caribbean. So this is also what's going to intensify our thunderstorm coverage as we go through the back end of today. If you're watching this video, you may already be seeing some of this thunderstorm and severe weather activity in your neighborhood, but this is also so what's going to extend this scenario for us in central Florida for an extended period of time as this continues to move off to the north, running right over the Florida Peninsula, meeting up with this tropical, non-tropical entity that's working up towards the panhandle. So we're getting a package deal with this, and we can't forget that Lydia is in hot pursuit.
pursuit of this. What's left over of her moving across Mexico is going to scrape the Gulf coastline of Texas, Louisiana, adding to our overall rain and storm coverage over the next 24, 48 hours. This is the part I really want to hammer home, guys. Not only can you see on the left-hand side, we're looking at the high-resolution rapid refresh, or the HER for short, the HRRR model. On the left-hand side is our simulated radar, and on the right-hand side, we have what's called our SIG TORN or Significant Tornado Parameters. In layman's terms, what that model is doing is taking every piece of the environment and all the dynamics specifically that could create a tornado in your area and putting it together and showing the areas that the greatest emphasis on these dynamics coming together could be happening. And if we go through the loop, not only can you see that widespread shower and thunderstorm activity go up, but if you start paying attention during the overnight hours on the right-hand side, take a look at how much the HRRR really amps up our tornado threat as that mass area of thunderstorms moves across the peninsula during the overnight hours. So this is after sundown. That's where things get a little dangerous. And if you remember from a few episodes back when we were talking tropical storm Ophelia, I love extreme weather. I love talking weather. I love everything about weather, whether it be calm, clear, crystal weather, all the way down to the most significant of severe weather. And in this case, I don't dork around with anything happening at night when you can't see it coming towards you. So I definitely want to emphasize, and it's been echoed on other weather pages for that matter as well, please keep your electronic devices close, keep your weather radios close, keep some sort of connection to the outside world, especially to official sources like law enforcement and National Weather Service to make sure that there's nothing sneaking up your back door as you try to go to bed tonight and into tomorrow. We're still anticipating areas of localized flooding, three, four, maybe even five inches of total accumulated rainfall before this system is all said and done. And as you get towards the very tail end of this run of the HRRR, you can see what looks to be almost like a frontal tail associated with this feature. So it looks like there could be a secondary round of significant thunderstorms, maybe not too much in the way of hail, strong winds, or tornadic potential with this, but we're still going to see another round of significant weather as we go through Thursday and maybe even to the very early morning hours of Friday. Storm Prediction Center is also on board with this. Here we are. This is today's convective outlook, and you can see over the plains, for that matter, where we're expecting cyclogenesis or the formation of our Colorado low we've been talking about for the last several days. There's also a marginal risk for thunderstorm coverage through most of the Midwest moving into the Great Lakes region. But if you look down over the southeast, we have a widespread area of thunderstorm potential as well as a slight indication for embedded severe over most of Florida. Storm Prediction Center has actually widened this outlook from what we saw yesterday. Yesterday, most of western Florida was bullseyed for that slight potential through the day today. But if you go forward in time, we see an even more expansive area of marginal to slight severe weather possible for Florida throughout the day of Thursday. So it looks like this is going to be an even more extended event than what we were forecasting. I did mention yesterday that this is likely to linger into Thursday because of how wide scale this system is. And it looks like Storm Prediction Center is picking up what we've all been putting down as well and increasing the likelihood that this is going to trickle into Thursday. Thursday and maybe even very early on Friday the 13th. At the same time, over the Midwest, the Great Plains, you can see that they're also increasing their severe weather potential as that system begins to deepen down over Colorado here and move off to the east-northeast at a pretty rapid rate with the polar front jet digging in that's going to form our trough over the east coast that we talked about during that comparison tool of the Canadian and the GFS. So honestly, everything happening all at once is really going to help determine what happens in the Atlantic. There's so many evolving pieces to this puzzle over North America and and it's crazy to say, guys, that's how affiliated and connected the weather pattern is across the globe. What we are tracking in the United States is absolutely going to impact what we see with Tropical Storm Sean, as well as when Tropical Storm Tammy does get her identifier with the National Hurricane Center. Based on the data that I've been looking at, I'm calling it already. We're probably going to see Tammy here within the next few days as that tropical wave continues to deepen down. We already have it highlighted as an Invest 94 area, so National Hurricane Center is doing digging in it as well, and all of our models are very conclusive in terms of wanting to spin something up, whether it be a tropical depression or a tropical storm. And the Euro ensembles last night, I haven't pulled them up for you guys, are indicating a very potent hurricane moving in close to the Caribbean before maybe skirting out into the Atlantic or moving just a little further west to wreak havoc on our Caribbean nations, especially the Lesser and Greater Antilles. Now, I know this was a very fast-paced weather center segment. I do apologize for that. There's just so much to cover out there in North America and the North Atlantic, for that matter, that I didn't want to spend 30, 45 minutes, almost upwards of an hour, diving into all the nitty-gritty. So what I ask of you guys tuning in today, please come join us for our 8 p.m. Tropics Talk. You can ask all the questions and drop all the comments you like. I'm more than happy to engage with you and make sure that all your questions are taken care of and answered to the best of my ability. There's just too much in the 
the small scale to highlight here in a segment that we're going very generalized and highlighting the main areas that I'm investigating day to day, morning to night, as we go and make these segments on a regular basis. So with that being said, we're going to close out the video. I know this was very fast, guys. I do apologize again for that. It's not like me to go kind of just broad brush everything. But again, please tune in tonight if you want the incidentals for everything that's expected to take place, not only real time, but in the long term out there in the Atlantic. I hope the second week of October has been grand for everybody tuning in. And for those of you who aren't, I hope this video finds you well and you tune in before it's too late to get some critical updates for your areas in the southeast or across the Midwest Great Plains area as the next severe weather event begins to unfold over the next 24 hours. Thank you all for watching. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining me on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. Let's all hunker down if you live down here local in the central Florida area and let's prepare for what this thing is going to unleash. We've been talking about it for two weeks and now it's finally floating in on our doorstep, guys. We'll see you later tonight for our 8 p.m. Tropics Talk. I really look forward to seeing you there. We'll cover all the details and get a little more specific so we can spend that full hour plus talking about everything and addressing everything that needs to be addressed. But until then, guys, you know what's next. This is Weather Center Nazario signing out.